so much for inviting me to speak at this conference. Everybody I know who works with children is a really nice person, so it's nice to be basically surrounded by really nice people who will forgive me if I don't make this clicker work. So computer's over here. There you there go. There we go. All right. See? <laughs> nice people. Help me out. Science. This is going to be a real quick talk. Uh, we're looking at 20 minutes. We'll be looking at uh, trends in mental health treatment for children. So what is science? Science is basically a means of predicting the future. And the weatherman uses science. Usually he's right, sometimes he's wrong. Um, we're looking at um, somebody like uh, oh, Werner Von Braun used science, standing on the shoulders of giants, as Sir Isaac Newton put it, to um, help come up with the atomic bomb. Okay. What we use science for in child psychiatry is to figure out what treatments actually work for what conditions. The National Institutes of Mental Health has um, taken a stance different from that of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Committee for the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, NIMH is moving more towards symptom clusters, so novelty seeking, harm avoidance, um, sleep issues, as opposed to DSM-5 diagnoses, which are things like major depression, ADHD. So the science over at NIMH is diverging from the clinical uh, description, and that's for adult and child psychiatry. So with science, we try to predict the future. Okay. Trends in children's mental health. If mama ain't happy, and nobody happy. And that is a truism. Our grandmothers knew that, our grandfathers knew that, and it took science to prove that. And it's been proven over and over and over again. So in the Green Journal, the Journal of the American Psychiatric Association, which is our most prestigious journal, there was an article, an original article, within the past couple of years, looking at mothers who adopted children. And the ones, the adoptive moms who were depressed the biologic children and the adoptive children both had an equally high depression rate, well above that of moms who aren't depressed. Okay, that's nice and interesting. It says that if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, and it's more than just genetic. This is um, followed up by the STAR-D trial. The STAR-D trial is National Institutes of Mental Health. Everything that I'm going to talk about is NIMH funded. It's not drug company funded, unless I say otherwise. The STAR-D trial is an adult depression trial, the systemized treatment alternatives for depression in adults, and one of the sub-analyses in the STAR-D trial, which is looking at, you know, what's best, Selexa, cognitive behavioral therapy, Effexor, lithium, so it's essentially an algorithm for depression in adults, multi-site across the country. One of the sub-analyses is mothers whose children had mental health problems, if mom's depression remitted, like magic, the kids became less symptomatic, isn't that something? So we don't treat kids in a vacuum, ideally. Ideally, we understand that prepubertal children, particularly, are part of the family system. If mama ain't happy and nobody happy, when I, when I have a child that I'm seeing, as an inpatient particularly, I will give mom a Beck depression inventory to fill out. Because we know from the multimodal treatment analysis trial from the National Institute of Mental Health, again, a landmark trial with regards to ADHD, if mom's score is 11 or more on the BDI, the child's response to stimulant won't be as robust. Go figure. Um, if mama isn't doing well, child's not going to be doing, whoops, not going to be doing back. well. All right. Treatment of pediatric depression and anxiety. I didn't skip one, did I? All right. Depression, yeah. You want that one? Nope. I want the next one, thanks. Pediatric depression and anxiety. Cut to the chase. What's the treatment of choice for pediatric depression? There are multiple trials, including the landmark Treatment of Adolescent Depression trial, the TADS trial, which is, again, an IMH funded, was done at Duke University, principal investigator was, oh, um, that'll come to me in just a second, um, very famous child psychiatrist and it's just flown out of my head. And what he found was that the treatment of choice for adolescent depression is Prozac and cognitive behavioral therapy, formal cognitive behavioral therapy. And he had an effect size that was pretty robust. There was an 80% response rate, which is a um, very, very strong response rate for that combination. Placebo response was in the 30s. Other pediatric depression trials, there's the TORDIA trial, the TASA trial. TORDIA is treatment of resistant depression in adolescents. Again, NIMH funded. TASA is a treatment of adolescent suicide attempters. Again, NIMH funded. And over and over and over again, it's 
an SSRI, Prozac being a prototype, fluoxetine, sorry I didn't mean to use the brand name, and uh, also cognitive behavioral therapy. And there are certain types of CBT that are better for kids who are suicidal, and that was investigated in the TASA trial. And you can get online, look up NIMH, and look up the particulars of these trials. Pediatric anxiety, what's the evidence based there? For pediatric anxiety, again, and I made data, another landmark trial, the CAM trial, a children's anxiety multimodal treatment trial. The CAM trial, uh, one of the principal investigators, uh, John Walkup, um, John March was the principal investigator for the landmark TADS trial. John Walkup, again, another child psychiatrist, very well respected academician, looked at how do you treat kids with various anxiety disorders, generalized anxiety disorder being the prototype separation anxiety over anxious disorder in childhood. And it is, no surprise, Zoloft, another SSRI, so sertraline and CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Over and over and over again, we're looking at SSRI and CBT that robustly beats out placebo. And either one will beat out placebo all by itself. And the mean age of this trial was 10 years, four months, and the mean dose for those who are interested in sertraline was 100. So it wasn't a little 25 milligram kiss, it was a robust dose. All right, so that's childhood anxiety. There we go. Pediatric bipolar disorder, what's the evidence base there? Well, again, we turn to NIMH because National Institutes of Mental Health has the best, in my opinion, science. Because what they say is gonna happen actually does happen. So there was a big push towards every kid who had a bad temper, who woke up on the wrong side of the bed, who had mood swings minute to minute, and would yell and scream as soon as they were thwarted or given a command. They were all labeled bipolar. And this was about 10 years ago. Sometimes I still see that misdiagnosis applied. NIMH did a fantastic job. Judith Liebenluf is the director of the Pediatric Bipolar Division of the National, National Institute of Mental Health. And Dr. Liebenluf led that team to make it crystal clear pediatric bipolar disorder looks just like adult bipolar disorder, the narrow phenotype. It's not, I'm angry, I'm irritable, I'm explosive, I, I'm oppositional, I become angry way out of proportion to the stimulus. What it is, is kids who have a parent, generally, with bipolar disorder, they themselves will have four days or more, where every day for four days in a row they need less sleep, they have more energy, they're supercharged, they're taking risks they normally wouldn't take, they're hypersexual. All of the things that an adult would do, at least four days back to back, and it's a definite change from baseline. That's it. That's pediatric bipolar disorder. There's no soft criteria for it for bipolar disorder type one. Bipolar type two is less well defined, but NIMH is mostly looking at bipolar one. What's the treatment of choice for pediatric bipolar disorder? Antipsychotic. Unfortunately, uh, in the trials that have been done to date at NIMH, the mood stabilizers don't do as good a job as the antipsychotics. And the reason I say unfortunately, the, the, mood, the mood stabilizers do a good job with adults. That would be the lithiums, the depicotes, the tegretols, the lamictals. There's a lamictal trial going on right now at NIMH, and I nice, they might still be recruiting children for that trial. But to date, it's the antipsychotics. That would be the Zyprexas, the Risperdals, the Syroquels, the Invegas, and the Abilifies. That's what works in pediatric bipolar disorder. Unfortunately, because those chemicals also have a lot of side effects. And um, so it's a mixed bag. We don't want kids to go on and have episode after episode of mania, but by the same token, we're giving a lot of side effects with antipsychotic. So that is the evidence base for pediatric bipolar disorder. What does pediatric bipolar disorder grow up to have? Bipolar disorder. They, they have it when they're little, they have it when they're bigger. It's genetic. And it has to be treated pretty much lifelong. Um, if you have it when you're little, chances are your genetic penetrance is really strong, and so it will be harder to treat than in someone who has their first manic episode at age 35, and who has been high functioning until age 35, unfortunately. Alrighty, let's see. Uh -huh. Treatment of pediatric aggression. This is the bread and butter in child psychiatry. This is ADHD. <clears throat> Pediatric aggression is what I uh, wind up, uh, Ms. Chris is in the audience, I hope you don't mind my pointing you out, Ms. Chris is one of the registered nurses who uh, dedicates her time to the children's inpatient unit at St. Al's. And she knows that over and over and over and over and over again, the reason for admission in the pediatric population is maladaptive aggression. 
what do we do for maladaptive aggression in youth? Well, again, I'm going to refer you to a trial. Well, that's not true. It's a consortium, the TMA consortium, capital T, I think, capital M-A-Y. It's the treatment of maladaptive aggression in youth, just what it should be. And that, again, is uh, based on a lot of expert opinion based on the data from NIMH. And as it turns out, the treatment of choice for maladaptive aggression in youth is behavior modification, supervision, parent management training. And if you can have some of the really intensive interventions that they can afford sometimes back east um, in academic centers, where you have a therapist who's available for one week at a time, 24 hours a day, with a very small caseload, <laughs> to, go <in. laughs> to go in and help parents with, with youngsters who have maladaptive aggression. It is cost effective, actually, compared to having them involved in the criminal the juvenile justice system. But insurance won't pay for it. So like, can you call my insurance company? <laughs> <laughs> insurance won't pay for it, unfortunately. So kids wind up, unfortunately, kind of limping over to the juvenile justice system by default, some of these youngsters with maladaptive aggression. That's the best treatment, is parent management training. So things like 123 Magic, we use on the uh, behavioral health unit for the 12 and unders at St. Al's. Uh, Parenting with Love and Logic, I do believe, is offered by the Boys Independent School District, for instance. Um, it's very difficult for parents to do this frequently. Um, not always, but frequently, families where the youngsters are out of control, the parents are also a bit in chaos, and so it's hard to get that structure in to be absolutely 100% on with behavior modification. It's very rigorous and demanding, but that is the treatment of choice. And then when you're looking at medication treatment of choice with pediatric regression, um, hands down, it's my least favorite class of medication, antipsychotics. Again, Risperdal down to age five, Abilify down to age six, Seroquel down to age 10, Zyprexa age 13, and in Vega, I do believe, down to age 13. Those are the ones that are FDA approved for, not aggression, they're uh, FDA approved for schizophrenia, bipolar disorder in that age group. Risperdal and Abilify are approved for some aggression, stereotypies, self-harm in the, uh, the PDD population, the autism spectrum disorder population. The, F, the Food and Drug Administration is starting to look more at medications to target a symptom rather than targeting a diagnosis. Again, NIMH is looking at symptoms to research in terms of biochemistry and genetics as opposed to diagnoses. And the Food and Drug Administration has been more along the lines of the DSM, looking at diagnoses to treat. But FDA is starting to look at drugs to treat a symptom. Aggression would be a huge money maker for an anti, specific anti-aggressive agent. There is no medication currently that is FDA approved specifically for aggression. We wind up using the antipsychotics because they work. They have a strong effect size. Um, Risperdal being the poster child for antipsychotics with an anti-aggressive effect. Then uh, the other medication in, in children with ADHD is stimulant. So in kids with ADHD, you start off with stimulant and treat the ADHD, and frequently the aggression just melts away when their frustration level melts away. You never have to go to another medication. A little parent management training, stimulant, and you're done. That's with children with ADHD, especially the younger children, meaning under age 12. And then third line for um, treatment of pediatric aggression is Depakote. And that has a couple of trials. It's soft data. Valproic acid is an anti-seizure medicine. It's also FDA approved for migraine prophylactic prevention of migraine and also um, for bipolar disorder. Okay. And it non-specifically will decrease aggression. And this is part of the problem with bipolar disorder. Kids that are out of control are they bipolar because the antipsychotics work and Depakote works. Well, yeah, but non-specifically the antipsychotics and Depakote will decrease aggression. It doesn't mean that the child has bipolar disorder because the same drug works for both. So that's pediatric aggression. ADHD, all right. To treat or not to treat ADHD. Let's look at the evidence base. Um, ADHD is um, highly familial, extremely heritable, and there are many reasons to have ADHD. You can have ADHD symptoms because mother was smoking cigarettes and drinking alcohol when she was pregnant. You can have ADHD because you are being molested, abused at home because mother is depressed. Uh, we know that in boys, particularly, if mom is depressed, they look, um, they are more likely to get a diagnosis of ADHD by age four and maladaptive aggression by age eight, just 
another factoid about how bad maternal depression is. But I'm talking about the genetic ADHD, where it's ADHD pretty much all by itself, maybe with a little learning disability, a little oppositional defiance. Um, ADHD, incidentally, that accompanies autism spectrum disorders, doesn't respond well to stimuli. That's just a given. So I'm talking about typically developing children with ADHD. Stimulant is the treatment of choice, hands down. And that's from the multimodal treatment analysis trial, the landmark trial, 1997 to 1999, looking at almost 600 school-age kids, ages seven to nine, looking at excellent parent, modif um, parent management training, behavior modification, teacher training, summer camp, one-to-one -one in the classroom at all times, versus stimulant medication in the hands of an academic child, a psychiatrist who see them for half an hour a month, versus combination of the two, the excellent psychosocial treatment plus excellent medication management versus treatment in the community as usual. And as it turns out, the treatment of choice for, for uncomplicated ADHD, meaning inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and maybe a little irritability, explosiveness on the side, is a stimulant. It's a neurologic, genetic, inherited condition. And what NIMH is now looking at is that it's probably not a categorical diagnosis. It's probably on a spectrum, like blood pressure or pulse or height. It's not like being pregnant or not. And so <laughs> ADHD is one in 20 kids worldwide has it. And there is a variant of ADHD that's pretty common where there are um, more than seven repeats of the D4 allele, which the, what I'm getting at is that NIMH is looking at the genetics behind it to know who will respond best to stimulant and who won't genetically. The idea is hopefully one day we'll be able to do a scan or a blood test and just be able to say, this is your diagnosis, this is the best treatment, here you go, and you can go off to Walmart and get it. <laughs> <laughs> what happens if you don't treat ADHD? This is old news. You wind up in trouble with the law. You wind up with unwanted pregnancies as an adolescent. You wind up uh, with substance use problems. You wind up not completing school. You wind up not being able to keep a job. You wind up uh, not being able to stay in your marriage. And um, in psychiatry, we see the most awful outcomes of ADHD where young adults, 25 years old, and I see this in prison all the time, who probably didn't, don't have a diagnosis of anything, but early ADHD come from very nice families, it wasn't treated, and then they wind up getting in the wrong crowd because they're not able to compete in school, they start doing drugs, they start having sex because they're, they're novelty seeking and impulsive, they <coughs> think after they act, they wind up dropping out, they wind up getting into meth because it's pleasurable. The actual drug of choice for youngsters with ADHD is uh, marijuana, it's not meth. But it's the meth that gets them into South Boise. So that is ADHD. Now, is there a medication treatment other than stimulant? Okay. This is uh, the predicting the future part, right? From science, I can look at a mom who brings a child in with ADHD, nine years old, and the teacher says, he's really trying, but he's frustrated, he can't pay attention, he can't sit in his seat, he can't, um, can't think before he acts, he blurts things out. And I can look at that mom and say, okay, in the next three weeks, your child has a nine out of 10 chance, 90% chance that he will have his symptoms normalized. The teacher won't be able to tell if he has ADHD or not. He'll look just like the other kids in the classroom that are unaffected. That's what I mean by science, that the brain is an organ and we can predict what's going to happen when people have genetic syndromes at this point. But there is no blood test. There's no genetic testing. It's pretty soft call, and that's what the National Institutes of Mental Health is looking at. So that's the trend in child psychiatry, is looking at biomarkers, for instance, or EEGs, or brain scans, lab tests, to be able to help with diagnosis and know which genes are causing your diagnosis, because most diagnoses in psychiatry are what we call polygenic. There's a lot of ways to get to the diagnosis of ADHD, even genetic ADHD. And some people respond better to amphetamine product like Adderall. Some will respond better to methylphenidate product like Concerta. And rather than trial and error, which is the current way, the state of the art, it'd be just, we're gonna check this blood test, we'll tell you what you need. All right, non-specificity of pediatric psychiatric symptoms. That all being said, it's well and good to say, oh yep, yep, I can diagnose generalized anxiety disorder, major depression, bipolar disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, trichotillomania, ADHD, reactive attachment disorder, but the reality is that for most youngsters who come in, especially prepubertal kids, they come in and they're just out of control. What's the diagnosis, Dr. Germain? I don't know, they're out of control. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then you have to start ferreting out, well, 
did you use substances of abuse in, in, when you were pregnant? <laughs> and did you breastfeed? And did you need oxygen at birth? We're looking for, um, for um, neurochemical risk factors, impacts on the developing brain. Um, there's a pretty interesting research in this month's Green Journal looking at completed suicide, which will take me to the next. This was just, I'm apologizing for the fact that I don't have the right diagnosis all the time. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. There we go. Okay, I think this is the final slide. This takes me to the final slide. And this is, this is obviously the worst possible outcome, worst catastrophe. Suicidality versus suicide. And I'm gonna also address um, non-suicidal self-harm, okay, just briefly. So there's a, this is nice because it's just hot off the press. Speak about trends in child psychiatry. This is actually with regards to adults, but it's very interesting in this month's Green Journal, as I mentioned, the May 2013 Journal of the American uh, Psychiatric Association, an article from Quebec, so I'm very proud of that, looking at French-Canadian men, uh, about 50 of them, who died by suicide. And when they're left the camp by, were probed, obviously post-mortem. As it turns out, these men had more methylation of certain base pairs on their DNA. Their DNA had been changed. Methylation turns off a gene. And this is, everybody has methylation acetylation that occurs. It's adding a little carbons or adding a few molecules to certain base pairs on the twisty strand of DNA, and that will activate or inactivate on the promoter region that turns a gene off or on, so that your ear is an ear and not a nose. Everything else is turned <laughs> off in those cells, except for the ear cells, right? Same thing with neurons, brain cells. The fight or flight, the ability to tolerate stress, the ability to not get depressed in overwhelmingly crushing negative conditions. We know that early life adversity um, child abuse, child neglect, increases the risk for psychopathology later on. Why is that? And this, these are the first glimmerings that are so exciting of epigenetic changes, that's what it's called, when your, your double helix, your DNA, winds up having little pieces of it just turned off by getting other little molecules latched on because of environmental stressors. And men who um, commit suicide in, in this French Canadian trial or study actually have significantly more methylation of their DNA for neurons, not for glial cells, but for the active brain cells in the left hippocampus, which is saying that, and, and there's also, that's partly replicating a study looking at methylation in the brains of adults post-mortem who had been abused as children. So these are just suicides compared to people who had been abused as children and then are examined post-mortem, same part of the brain. We, it's toxic to the brain, early abuse and neglect, and we're figuring out exactly what's happening. It's a genetic change in the brain that occurs, the gene expression, with early sustained trauma. We know this from animal models, from rats and monkeys. Now we're taking a look at it kind of through the back way, looking at grown-ups. And so hopefully um, children's mental health I guess the punchline is that children's mental health hopefully will allow more public attention, funding, more sensitivity to how important it is to take care of our littlest citizens because the bad things that we're doing <coughs> now, this is for the population that are abused and neglected. I'm not talking about the ones that are raised in perfectly nice ordinary families but have strong genetic loading. Those are the two populations I see. I'm talking about the ones that have been abused and neglected those epigenetic changes, that'll be really interesting to see if that can give us therapies to target those when they get older so that we can demethylate those parts of the genes so they can now express themselves in the neurons and they can be healthy, a completely different way to treat depression, for instance. Suicidality versus suicide. This is a huge deal. I'll make it just cut to the chase. Then the Food and Drug Administration requires for anybody 24 or under to um, have, read the little black label that says, warning, uh, if you use this medication, your risk of suicidality increases. And that's for anti-seizure medicines, it's for lithium, it's for Stratera, which is an ADHD medication, it's for Shantix, which is an anti-smoking medication, it's for all the antidepressants. 
And the way that the FDA popped up with that is that they asked Columbia University when there were reports from very sloppy, I must say, very sloppy trials across the country of drug companies trying to get in on the bad one, bang, bandwagon of getting six extra months of patent on antidepressants by testing them for safety in children. It's a lot of money to get six, to, six extra months on patent. So in the mid-2000s, all these drug companies were having very sloppy studies that were poorly done that showed kids becoming suicidal on antidepressants. Okay, so FDA said, oh, let's get Columbia University to look at this and see what the problem is. And Columbia came up with essentially a questionnaire about suicidality. And I'm going to be a little bit sarcastic, but painting your fingernails black and drawing pictures of people hanging and listening to death metal, all of that was counted, unfortunately. Also, unfortunately, cutting was counted. And cutting is actually a pretty rare form of completed suicide. What we're trying to avoid is completed suicide. Completed suicide, we're still not very good at predicting in the near future. We can look at risk factors overall, but completed suicide is still a black box to a large extent. Suicidality, does that predict Completed suicide? Well, yes, but there's a huge pool of adolescents that have had suicidality. So, in the United States, one in 15 people in their lifetime are suicidal. In Italy, it's 3%, okay? Uh, did I say one in 15? I'm sorry, one in seven people in the United States. So 15% of the American population has been suicidal at one time or another. In Italy, it's been 3%, and in Japan, I think 9%, okay? We are quite suicidal as a nation. Suicidality winds up getting in the way of protecting youngsters because, for instance, there is a very large uh, insurance company, Kaiser, in California, that has an enormous database and has looked at actual completed suicide rates for young people before and after this box warning from FDA came out. Before, the rate was actually lower than after the box warning came out. Family docs, pediatricians became frightened to give depressed teenagers medication to treat their depression. So, unfortunately, I think that well -meaning, in a well-meaning way, the FDA kind of is missing the boat. They're looking at suicidality, but because it's so hard to treat, and it's so hard to predict, and the numbers, thank God, are so small for completed suicide, it's a lot easier to study suicidality. That being said, what is cutting then? About half of teenagers have cut. Girls are more likely to cut. Boys are more likely to burn or hit. Or, um, hit. On the inpatient unit, about 80% of teenagers have cut. Okay? Cutting relieves stress. Cutting makes other people feel guilty. Cutting engages attention from other people. Cutting decreases dissociation. Cutting allows young people who are feeling psychic pain to focus on the physical pain so that they don't dissociate, for instance. It allows them to tolerate the psychic pain. It's a treatment. It is not a suicide attempt, hardly ever. And the reason I bring that up is because um, parents will become very concerned about it as thinking that it is a suicide attempt. And almost never is it. The very superficial cutting that occurs, it'll get you in the hospital for sure. But it's very different from having a firearm in the home or having access to medication in the home. Those are potentially lethal. So suicidality versus suicide, stigma. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.